I'm very happy to be here and the first time to present something in Australia. And uh, the topic, identity, I think everyone is familiar with the subject, identity. Every one of us, well, since we were born, we try to identify who we are all the way until we're close to our life uh, span. So uh, along the way, I think especially for architects, uh, the definition of identity is even more critical. So who we are, before you can tell what is my architecture, the first thing you need to do is to identify who we are, right? So uh, it's a subject that is so familiar with everyone, but also it's a, some, sometimes uh, it, it's, it is a very uh, interesting perspective how we look at ourselves. And uh, this issue of identity is not a big issue uh, thousand years ago because we live isolated in our own community, with our own family, with our own society. Only after industrialization, when globalization happens, when borders became constantly changing, when there's a center, there's a periphery, when the periphery changes all the way, the people in the periphery and the people in the center become more and more cautious about the shifting of identity. And so uh, we know that we see the world differently from different perspectives based on our living environment. Uh, so we, we see the world from different perspectives, like, uh, for example, uh, those people who studied material science will probably describe this boat according to the material, right? Carbon or wood or metal, whatever. It would describe the quality of the material to describe this particular shape. And then uh, people from design will probably describe this according to its, uh, the, uh, the form based on particular ideas of his, his or her understanding of the function of this particular boat. But there's also another way to look at this boat from a different perspective. What kind of experience this boat brought us along the way from here to here and in the end to here? Then we know that the, uh, the vision, the perspectives that we had or developed along the way decided what we look at, right? A very simple uh, example, the globe, the sphere, is a very common geometry in nature. Very few of us will challenge this particular shape, right? But one day, if somebody asks you a question like, what's the, why all the stars in the universe share the same shape as the grapes? And then you'll be surprised. Why this two took the same shape, right? Interesting question, right? It's kind of a Zen kind of a approach. Huh? Why? I think uh, for a while, even though uh, you know the answer yourself as well. Well, the common thing about sphere is that you have the largest volume, but smallest surface, right? Which is easy and more efficient to protect the content. That's why all the stars took the shape of sphere. And all the fruits with water inside would take this shape as well. And then we understand why the lifts shaped like this, right? Because you need surfaces to get more efficient way of getting energy from the solar energy, uh, from the sun, right? Uh, and then another interesting example, when we look at the Chinese garden uh, like this, that's the Chinese character garden. And from the character, you can see that there's a, a wall, it's a boundary and there's just trees inside, there's a water body inside. And the most important character of Chinese gardens is like this. The corridor is an important element, the pavilion is an important element, the trees are important elements. The most important thing is the, the corridor. It's always elongated. You don't do shortcut. You always try to go through the gardens as long as possible. Where our neighbors, Japanese garden, will take this kind of shape. 
you stay put, you see the garden in front of you. Why the difference? We're neighbors, right? And the Japanese culture uh, share tremendously its roots with Chinese one. But why suddenly it comes to the gardens? We took different uh, approaches. The inspiration comes from different things. In China, uh, the typical landscape is like this. This is Yellow Mountain. All the Chinese knows where this mountain is. And this mountain is about, uh, so when you look from afar, it is very different from looking from close distance. And in different seasons, it looks quite different. And different time of the day, it's quite different. So you need dynamic process of experience to understand the mountain. But where in Japan, the landscape is represented by this, volcanoes. Volcanoes, like uh, you look from Tokyo, is like this. You look at close distance, it still looks like this. Yeah? So you don't need to bother to go through a dynamic process. So natural environments inspired us for our physical artificial environments. And uh, very few people know that this is actually the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, drawing, of course. But very few people know that Frank Lloyd Wright was the first contemporary architect who used bird's eye view perspective to represent his work. Do you know that? No, okay. <laughs> you know, okay, thank you. Uh, before him, the Western uh, look at the uh, objects through perspective, human eyesight, right? You see all those paintings since the Renaissance, all those architectural representations and drawings are done through the human eyes. The Western look at the world through our human eyes. But in China, we look at the world differently. We never look at our world through the human eyes, but the God's eye. Yeah? So all those paintings of architecture are drawn from bird's eye view perspectives. And that's uh, very interesting, right? And imagine that the, if the Chinese uh, represent their architecture through perspectives, you will all only look at the corner of the wall. You won't see nothing beyond the wall, right? You won't see architecture beyond architecture. But in this way, you can see buildings beyond building, courtyards beyond courtyards. And through this multiple vanishing points, that we can describe a story through a painting, a scroll, open up like a movie, right? So identity, uh, we know that the, in the past, before industrialization, every country, every culture has its own identity. And, uh, but then, last century, things industrialization, since modern architecture becomes something that we all look for, we spent a whole century, all the architects tried very hard to identify themselves through their architecture. We see styles of a particular individual in their work. And, uh, but this century, we have an issue of sustainability. We don't have that kind of resource to be wasted to represent individual identity through our work anymore. Oh, we, we'll uh, go for that later on. Right? So then how, and, uh, how we approach these issues of identity in the future? And this is what I'm trying to, uh, to go a little bit deeper into. It. And this is China looking from afar in terms of distance. And uh, Chinese are very, uh, try very hard to become uh, international families. And this is China looking from close distance. We have a lot of problems because this rapid urbanization for the last 40 years, uh, we don't have time to be reflexive. So along the way, we do things very fast. We create problems very fast as well. We are all the Chinese are familiar with this kind of image, right? And uh, the image on the left is what we do construction in the past. Very careful. And the image on the right is what we do things now. Very fast, the pollution, everything 
uh, density, everything. Uh, two different worlds, two different stories. And uh, 100 years ago, uh, this, his name is Liang Qichao. He is the first Chinese who realized that China is simply another culture. So before him, every Chinese believed we are the center of the universe. So that's why they called the central kingdom, right, Zhongguo. So he went to study in Japan. And from Japan, that is the end of 19th century. He looked at China, he suddenly realized that, OK, this is simply another culture. Because from Japan, Japan has been industrialized uh, since the middle of the 18th, 19th century. And then he tried to reform when he came back to China. He was a professor in Tsinghua University. And he tried very hard, but he failed. And then we got another opportunity. Uh, 1949, New China, reunified China was established. And along the way, we tried very hard to establish the idea or the identity of Chinese, the new Chinese. Because before the communist China, China was actually uh, occupied and uh, bullied by different powers, right? Colonial powers and, 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 and different kind of wars and, and things like that. So we tried very hard to establish a new identity for China, for Chinese. And of course, along the way, ideology is a very important uh, issue uh, to be focused on. So along the, this way, uh, I think I, you are familiar with this kind of period, right? The Cultural Revolution, you know, all those the struggles. Is try to get an idea who we are, and uh, you know. So I won't I won't go too too much in, into this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so people understand the world understand China as a mouse China, right? He's like uh, the only individual who actually tells Chinese what to do and what we who we are, and uh, things like this, right? So after the, all those struggles. Uh, End of 1970, we suddenly become silent. It's almost like an old patient. You try to recover. But the early stage of recovery is very slow and very difficult. Huh? And uh, I still remember this one. This is uh, 1980, when I was still in school in Beijing. Uh, the exhibition of new artists, from, young artists from uh, from China, they organized uh, an exhibition. Uh, one of the most important uh, painting is this one, uh, Father. Uh, the, the name of this painting is Father. When you see this one, everyone was shocked because before this painting, all the art are, are something that pretending to be something else. There's no reality. The representation of artworks are not about a reality, but rather about idea of reality or particular ideology. And this one exposed reality three time, uh, 10 times larger. And that image, when you see the image, is really shocking, actually, for every Chinese. So starting from 1980s, we tried to reform, right? We tried to uh, identify who we really are and try to find a way uh, to solve our problems. <coughs> And uh, the political agenda become very subtle, become less uh, critical, but economic developments become more and more important. So we start to have TV, but there's no program. And then uh, there's tremendous discrepancy between the knowledge base of the older generation and the young one, because we stopped education for almost 10 years in college. No, no education, can you believe that? So this, this break of continuation of education basically stopped. And then our landscape, urban landscape, start to uh, going through a tremendous change and transformation. Uh, nobody knows how. And when we open the door to the rest of the world, uh, developed countries has been through modernism, postmodernism, but we haven't started modernization yet. So you can imagine the confusion in our mind I still remember when, when I was in school, when, I, when we suddenly were exposed to the magazines, the books from outside world, it's really, your, your mind is like very desperate. They have done all the designs, what we, should, we can do, you know? It's that kind of desperation. 
So uh, demolished and rebuilt is almost like a, it's a, almost like a revolution. I think uh, no culture in the world has been through this kind of a uh, struggle. So we don't know what to do. And then the government uh, invited IMP, an international renowned Chinese architects, to design an example to showcase what is contemporary Chinese architecture supposed to be? Because we didn't do design for over a decade. Nobody knows what to do. And then Pei presented his idea in this painting, in this drawing, to the government. And when they saw this painting, they were very disappointed in the very beginning because they were expecting Pei to design something modern and the Chinese at the same time. But this one obviously is Chinese but not a modern, right? But Pei got a Pritzker Award after this, right? And uh, Pei explained to the government people, says, uh, you don't need to, uh, before you become modern, you firstly have to find who you are, what's your identity, before you jump. And then this, they thought maybe this is a good idea, because in the 80s, it's really about confusions. It's really about a lack of confidence about our own identity, about our own culture. So Pei's idea is that you have to grab your confidence, identify who you are first. And uh, this is actually a project I was involved. I was uh, the, uh, the on-site supervisor for this construction of this project in 1984. So if I don't say anything, I think the audience will never be able to tell when this building was designed or built, right? It could be 200 years ago, right? It's, a, it's actually, a, you, you pick up the elements from the vernacular settlement in the area and then recompose them into, you do some hot, housekeeping and then you, you, you come up with the idea of a hotel. This is the hotel. So it's about uh, iconic representation of regionalist architecture. And that's the way that we learn from Pei. It's iconic, it's picturesque, it's not really about abstract, it's not about a function, but rather it's a recognizable form. So uh, after Pei's practice, uh, we kind of, uh, from 80s all the way to 90s, we were trapped in a particular uh, perspective. The architecture is either tradition or modern, east or west. It's a matter of choice. But architecture is not supposed to be a matter of a debate, right? You debate what is supposed to be the best solution. But in this case, it's become a matter of choice. And that is how architecture practice in China become like this. Well, you know, uh, when you talk about identity, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's OK. We understand that. But when you talk about a piece of architecture represent China, this is, you know this, right? Uh, the China Pavilion in the World Expo in Shanghai, 2010. Wow, you know, one piece of work represents China. And China has a history of 5,000 years. And now, 2010, modern, modern China. What do you do, you know? Iconic recognizable. So that's why the shape, the color, you know, the, the dimension, everything's like this, right? So compare with the, uh, uh, our neighbor pavilion, the British pavilion, it's very light, very easy. They're not bothered or struggled by anything about identity anymore. You can blow them away, right? It's so, so, so easy. Uh, those are the 10 most ugly buildings selected by the website uh, 2012 in China. So all those shapes and the forms are iconic, representative of a particular recognizable story or form or scenario, right? So we don't know. We don't know how to abstract things. So identity becomes something you have to recognizable, has to be recognizable. So uh, then we shift a little bit to some uh, two case studies to, 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 to learn from those case studies how uh, different cultures get their identity for their architecture. And this is in Singapore. Uh, in Singapore, you know Singapore is very young, right? Younger than me, 1965. 
uh, 50, only 53 years old, Singapore. So uh, people in Singapore are from China, from Europe, from India, from Malay. So it's a multicultural uh, society, but a very young one. And uh, in the very beginning, when Singapore established a country, the, firstly, they have to identify who are Singaporeans, right? So what they did is they, they built up this one, Marine Line Sculpture, a legend. So all the Singaporeans are supposed to be linked with this marine line structure. It's a story that you first arrive in Singapore, you meet this animal. So it's like the uh, all the Chinese are the son and daughter of the dragon. So all the Singaporeans are daughter son of the marine line. So you need a legendary story, right? Okay, they build up this one, but which is not enough. You have to build your city, your architecture, your artificial environments, and they don't know how. But the idea of having a, a Singapore in this tropical region is to have an advanced modern Singapore society. Then what they do is they invited all the international renowned architects to build something. So if you see the skyline of Marina Bay, you see all the famous names, and then come up with this uh, skyline. And then one day, Singaporean look at the island from the boat they suddenly realized that this has nothing to do with Singapore. Because all the architects, they design those buildings the same way they do in their hometown, which has nothing to do with Singapore. And then they start to discuss about what is supposed to be an architecture that identify the shape, the form, with Singapore. OK, there's no culture in Singapore. Now, what is supposed to be identified with? Nature, tropical life. And in tropical lifestyle, you need sun shading. You need cross ventilation. You need to keep the rain away, right? And along the way, actually, uh, of debate in Singapore, uh, the center of discussion is based on the post-colonial turn of theory, uh, which actually has to do with the center and the periphery. I just mentioned after industrialization, colonization, and, and all those things, uh, there's a center that's periphery. The periphery tried to become center through learning copy of the ideas of the center, right? But the periphery never become the center by copy. Yeah? The only way you become center is to do independent thinking. So that's the, that's the bottom line. And then the Singaporeans start to design buildings based on understanding of tropical lifestyle. Sun shading, cross ventilation. And this is a very good example. This is designed by Woha. The window opened horizontally. So during the monsoon season, the wind can go through, but not the rain. And this one won the uh, Aga Khan Prize in uh, 2007. This is because of detailed design which is very climatic responsive. And then they start to design buildings in Singapore like this, and like this. Porous, shaded, multi, uh, you know, this double skin uh, idea of the facade is very become very popular later on. And in the tropicals, you don't need to have a roof when you take a shower, raining or not raining. Right? It doesn't make much difference anyway. So then it opened up tremendous opportunities for design. And the second example is Hong Kong. You know, in Hong Kong, you don't need architects because they don't have land. <laughs> so what they do is they have a piece of land and they multiply, right? You don't have space. That's why you had it multifunctional. <laughs> so Hong Kong is like this. Do you like the dim sum? That's Hong Kong. So uh, standardization, but allows variety. <laughs> I think it's a very healthy one, huh? and very efficient as well. So uh, this uh, Gary's apartment is, is another example I, I would uh, elaborate a bit more. Uh, many, many years ago, the, the uh, Gary Chang is a, a very good interior design in Hong Kong. And he was born here. Uh, this is the plan. 
when he was born, his two sisters, himself, his parents, and uh, the bathroom, the kitchen, the dining area. This is four by eight, 32 square meters. Tiny, right? I mean, for Chinese standards, it's tiny. And then uh, years later, his family moved out. So this apartment became his, his own. And he, he says, uh, he told me that if I feel so big, you know, I, one person occupied the whole space. So he designed things like, uh, almost like a, it's a city square. That's what he told me. That's a square, that's a street by himself. And then one day he realized that, okay, if I am the only one who occupy the space, I will never use this similar space in different functions, right? As opposed to have different configurations for, for use, right? So he changed the layout in this kind of form. So by changing the pattern of the, the color of the lights, the curtains, so you use different functions. Daytime, you have a view. Nighttime, you have screen. And then, uh, well, if it's you're only one in the, in, in the room, you don't need this, the, the privacy for the toilet, right? <laughs> It'll be awkward when you have guests, of course. And he changed later again. And this time is really revolutionary. <laughs> That's him. He's very happy. But he never stay here. <laughs> this is like his showroom. Where is he stay? He stay in the hotel. He he lived in different hotels by writing comments on the hotel. So the hotel uh, offered him free stay in the hotel. <laughs> and this is like showroom. Every time he got clients, he would show the clients the, uh, the design of the space. <laughs> yeah. So all the two examples, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, they have this linkage between the bigger issue and the smallest one, right? So when you have this linkage, you won't make major mistakes because the identity in larger scale is settled. So this is what I'm trying to do. And this is one of my favorite uh, artist work, Wu Guanzhong. So you, you can see it's, it's Chinese, right? But you can tell also it's a contemporary. And uh, my first tryout is uh, uh, in Lijiang in Yunnan province. It's a school that we actually, it's a donation from, from, uh, from friends, from you know, different uh, foundations. And this is the reality. And uh, so the idea uh, for me uh, is that when you design something, it's really about this project. It's not really about, this is the media you try to present yourself. The identity of architecture should somehow merge with the project. And this is the site. And that the, uh, the sketch, we only have, uh, we, I remember, I only had, we only had about 300, how much is it? 60,000 uh, Australian dollars to build a school of 800 square meters. Mission impossible almost, right? And that's our condition. So based on this fund, we need to somehow think up about the labors, think about the, uh, the size, the dimension, the material, everything. It has to be contextualized. It has to be situational. Everything has to come up within this community. So everything very, goes very straightforward. It's in a village. So you know in a village, the fabric of the village is very small in terms of texture, in terms of space and dimension. And this one is a school. So slightly larger, but still you need to cope with the, the identity of the new one in relationship with the old one. So in terms of construction, it has to be earthquake resistant. So the way we do the buildings, 
together with the, the laborers from the, the country, from the, from the village, is also try to teach the local community uh, to learn how to build earthquake resistant buildings in, in later time. So this is the only way, this is the only thing that we, we built slightly defamiliarized with the, uh, uh, the local environments to give a little bit new identity for, for, the, for the school. Uh, in the end, we have this kind of a effect. And there's a new identity, but which is respective to the local environments. And the second project is in the same village, but it's a private house. And this is the site. Uh, when the clients uh, approached me in Singapore, when I, I was still teaching in Singapore, he said, I, I saw your project in the village, the school, and would you like to do a private house for me? That's my first client. And I was, of course, very happy. So we went out to see the site. I was very shocked when I, when I saw this in the middle of nowhere, in the mountain foot. And uh, this mountain is very famous. Yulong uh, Xuexuan Jade, called Jade Snow Mountain, which is very famous in China. And it's a very young, energetic mountain, like that, right? You, you know, in China, uh, if you don't have a balance of inner young, living environments is not really uh, habitable. So then we need to solve the problem of too much young energy. And then, of course, the Chinese theory, Chinese tradition helped us with this. And you know, the, uh, as I mentioned before, it's all about overall balance of yin and yang. It's all about together with environments. It's not about stand alone, right? So I need to present a yin energy to balance with a strong yang energy in the neighbors. Water represents in, enclosure represents in. So in this case, what I did is it provides about 2,000 square meters water surface and the enclosure of a courtyard. But a courtyard should not be too closed, that you don't see anything outside the courtyard, but rather it's a penetrable, you can, it's a porous one. You see outside, but at the same time, you feel enclosed, right? And material-wise, all the materials, 90%, 95% are from the locals. So the rocks from the mountain, the trees, the snow become water, things like that. And then when you approach buildings, you see the, through the steps, you see the mountain peaks. And then when you service, you see this. And you don't feel that young energy anymore. It's like the French dish, you know? Very small, right? But you present in a big plate. Very nice, yeah? <laughs> so this is like, a, okay, represent, representation, representation of landscape. Uh, because the surface of the water is very quiet, and also because the refined details, and also because the low profile of the, uh, of the buildings. So the mountains become less powerful now, in this case. No decoration, and my, my clients actually once asked me how to, where to hang my paintings. And I said, well, in front of the beauty of landscape, why you want to hang a painting, you know? <laughs> so there's no decoration, there's no even walls. And the third project is in uh, Fujian province. Don't find your hometown, right? Fujian province. This is in the, uh, uh, this one is a, is a tryout for my understanding about acupuncture approach uh, in uh, artificial, in the human environments. See whether uh, intervention of an architecture program can solve the problems of a community. And uh, so the site we chose actually is in a, in a very old community. And before, those people living in these two castles, you know those castles, eh? very, very popular, about four, four or five hundred years old. And uh, they are the earliest typology for apartment uh, living. And people used to live here. But later on, because the, uh, the security uh, safety issue is not anymore, uh, is not a major issue anymore, so they move out. 
because the window is too tiny, so the living uh, atmosphere is not really uh, nice. So everyone moves out. Before, there was a community in the center, public space. But when, you, when they move out, there was no master plan. So the whole village is occupied by those small houses. And the community become decaying all the time. And this is before my intervention. So my idea is to somehow uh, interfere the whole community with a little uh, gesture of architecture program to rejuvenate the energy flow in the community. It's like a human body when you are sick somehow. The Chinese medicine will say uh, the human body is about energy flow, is about the qi, right? The reason why you are sick is because it's blocked somewhere. So the idea is to make it flow again. And so in this case, it's about putting a, a needle, a piece of work of architecture in a particular position so the community become alive again. And that's a position between the two castles. There's a little creek. They used to fight with each other. It's two villages, and like Romeo and Juliet. And then, uh, so the idea is connection, linkage. So a bridge. So ideally, it's supposed to be a bridge. And here, we put a bridge over there. It's a bridge school. It's a school. It's a library. It's a, it's a performance stages for puppet show. And also, it's a, there's a little shop over there. So the mock-up is like this. It's about linkage, right? So physically, metaphysically, it's about the linkage. It's a playground as well for the kids. So one after school, they like to hang around. That's a stage for the puppy show, very popular. They organize puppy shows on two different stages on both ends of this. Uh, very porous. So in summer, you open up all the windows, the wind can go through. And become very popular afterwards because the awards, the publications, and so on and so forth. So become a tourist spot later on. And then it's a very remote uh, village in Fujian province and later on become a tourist site. So they build up uh, car parks, restaurants, to receive guests from all over the place. So the, the whole thing the, of this particular bridge actually changed the lifestyle of that village. And the next project is in Beijing. Uh, similar with the Fujian province uh, project, is also try to, uh, through the intervention of a little architecture program, to change the lifestyle of the community. And this time, it's a library. It's a small library. And this is the village. And I was very impressed when I first visited the, the, the village by this kind of texture. The twigs, they use this one to cook as well as to, uh, to heat up their, their home in winter. And uh, so the idea come to my mind is that uh, why architecture has to be permanent, you know? No architecture can be permanent anyway. So in case the architecture is not in use anymore, can we leave nothing on the ground? So all the material we use is supposed to be sustainable, supposed to be recyclable, right? So in this sketch, I try to present an idea of using this particular material, not as a decoration, but as a part of the function mechanic systems, how the building can sustain on its own without support of any power, because we don't have power supply anyway. So in winter, this is supposed to be warmer inside compared with outside. In summer, it has to be cooler than outside. And how we do that, and this is the test. This is also a challenge for me in this project. Uh, OK, this is the details of the facade. Three layers of the tricks is pro, try to provide a sheltering uh, device for light to, show, to be sheltered in. Instead of, uh, you know, if it's too straight, you don't have the environments for reading, right? And then, because of that, then we have this kind of environments. So the light filtered in uh, created a very uh, good ambience for reading.
but we do have to think about air conditioning. And this is how it works. You know, the reason why I set up the, uh, the building along the river is because the temperature over the surface of the water is much cooler. And then I need to bring in the cool air into the space and get the hot air away. So what I did is this. The cool air will go through the tunnel like this. And there's an opening here. It's much hotter here because there's two layers of glass. And between the two glass, there's a layer of twigs to provide direct sunshine, sun, sunlight. And the heat of this two layer on top will absorb the cool air in from below and get out from the window openings on human eyesight level. They're actually, the temperature inside the room is five degrees lower than outside. It's the same temperature with this, within the shadows. Of course, there's openings on the, uh, over the ceiling. To, to not too hot, right? If you're too hot, it's not comfortable. So you need this kind of a uh, height inside the space to create this kind of a, uh, air conditioning. And in winter, it's a reverse of the process. So the heat absorbed here will evaporate into the, uh, radiate into the space. And we didn't do anything on the facade. No chemical treatment whatsoever. So the plants can grow. And uh, the birds can find the nest as well. So uh, this evolution of building process become part of the evolution of nature. I think that's very nice, you know. It's not the building has to be so strong, so powerful, so artificial, but rather it can be, the identity of this one is in the countryside. It's trying to provide an environment for people from the city as well from the village to read, right? Well, as long as they serve the function, I'm happy with it. One day, it will disappear. It's like this now. If you go to Beijing, you visit this library, it's like this now. In winter, you see the color of the building really blend into the landscape. And uh, we use up all the money for the construction of the building, not enough money for the books. So actually, we put up a, a kind of invitation on the website. You are invited to visit library and to contribute three books, and you can take one book away. So this become exchange, platform of exchange of ideas. And everybody has some contribution towards the library. So in two months, we have all the collections. That's in winter. And uh, this is a new project. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's under development of uh, uh, proposal design uh, now. It's a factory. And this is the old factory. And uh, that's a new one. And the idea for this project is try to give a very uh, mono function of factory into a biodiversity type of lifestyle for the factory. So a new identity for the community, not just for the people working in this community, but also for the neighbor community as well. So you can do all kinds of things. It's a new lifestyle. It's not just you work there uh, eight hours a day, but rather you can, you can really enjoy working and living in that kind of environment. And this is an extension of uh, uh, Tsinghua University's architecture school project. We have a very restricted site so we, have, we can do nothing but somehow measure the, uh, the space and put up a very tight structure. And we calculate like, the space you, you need to provide. I know the height limits. In the end, we have a cube. And then if it's a cube, OK, the ruby cube will be nice, right? It's like a magic. So the students come from all over the place to learn architecture. After four years study here, you become architect. Magic. <laughs> so, uh, of course, design building like this is not just about the shape, but also about how 
everything else works, operation, space. So in this case, because the depths, you need to solve the problem of lighting, uh, ventilation, and public space, and things like that. That's the old building, that new one. And this is the interior. So the atrium provides the, uh, the sunlight uh, and daytime and also ventilation. There's opening on both ends on the top. So, and the next one is, uh, is uh, again, a new project in the city. Very big one. It's a school project, 80,000 80, square meters in Shenzhen. You know, Shenzhen is in a subtropical uh, city uh, in China. Uh, it's in the city center, downtown. And uh, we only, the site is only 20,000 square meters. We need to build up a school of 80,000 square meters. So the plot ratio is four. Uh, it's very difficult, right? You don't have this problem in, in Sydney, I guess. But the UTS does, right? It has a very high density issues. But in this case, we need to solve the problem. It's a high school, so we need to solve the problem of uh, they live there in the campus. They also practice there. They also get their education facilities. Everything is within the campus. So we need to solve every, everything. And uh, you know, when you design something, the first thing you, you, to do, you do, where is the first line you draw to develop your concept, right? And in China, I don't know whether in, in Australia you have the same problems. You have a site along the road in a, a, a block or whatever, and you need to have a right line and you have to recess five meters. Do you do that also here? The same thing, right? Okay, in the end, you come up with a block like that. So in this case, I tried to, because the site is too tight, so I talked with the, uh, the government POC whether I can uh, not to do resize because it's too tight, right? And we go to the sky, go to the three dimensions to solve the problem of the right line. So put everything over the podiums, and then put up building like that, which create tunnels, openings, sky gardens, level by level. That's the uh, running track is in the sky. We don't have space for running track. So somehow we have to uh, find our potentials for space in three-dimensional way, not horizontal layout. And those vertical uh, greeneries are part of the overall ecosystems to provide uh, sun shading and also to provide an ecosystem for the students uh, and, and the staffs living and study in this school. And uh, it provides actually uh, a new dimension of physical vision uh, for the urban neighbors in this area. And of course, uh, the identity for, for a school or institution, you need to have something beyond standardization and those are the, what, I, what I call mutation, you know? The kids love to have different things, right? So things like that. So not too rigid, not too rep repetitive. It's subtropical, so you feel this feelings about that kind of environments. And it's about high density, high density and it's about uh, how creatively you use the space. And then in the end, we have this. It's under construction now. So two years from now, I can show you the real photos of this project. Thank you.